morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to start this morning uh, with a presentation from Commissioner Pichek on our modeling, and then uh, we'll go to other remarks after that. Mr. Pichek. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Governor. I'm Mike Pichak, and I've been leading Vermont's data and modeling team uh, throughout the pandemic. Uh, we'll begin uh, today's press conference with an updated data presentation focusing on COVID-19's growth across the country, across our region, and then finally uh, in Vermont. As a reminder for those who are watching at home, uh, today's presentation is available on our department's website, dfr.vermont.gov along with uh, all of our resources from our modeling partners. Yesterday, the United States crossed the threshold of 4 million reported COVID-19 cases. This is a staggering number when compared to other countries around the world, but the pace at which we arrived at 4 million cases is also staggering. As you can see from the graph, it took the United States about 99 days to report its first 1 million COVID-19 cases. Although we should keep in mind that testing was limited during much of this period, we can see, however, that the pace of growth begins to speed up at an alarming rate. The U.S. adds an additional 1 million cases in only 43 days, followed by another million reported cases in only 28 days, followed most recently by hitting the 4 million mark in just 15 days. When we look at the daily growth rates across the U.S. Census regions, we do see some improvement in the areas of the South and the West. However, their numbers continue to be quite high on a daily basis. And we continue to see increased case counts in the Midwest as well. Further across our country as a whole, our seven-day rolling average for reported cases on a daily basis is the highest it's ever been throughout the pandemic, according to the CDC. Another concerning trend is the increase in hospitalizations and deaths across the country. Although Vermont has the lowest hospitalization and death rates on a per capita basis over the past seven days, we are seeing both of these metrics rise across parts of the South and across parts of the West. Yesterday marked the third consecutive day that the U.S. reported more than 1,100 deaths. And as you can see, the vast majority of these deaths did occur in the South and West Census region. Uh, with much lower numbers in the Northeast. Turning now to our regional data, our week-over-week -week new reported cases again grew this week. In the Northeast, we saw new cases rise just over 8% compared to last week. And when we compare our region's weekly total since May 21st, we see that this rise in new cases has become a trend, with the last three re weeks seeing an increase in case over case growth in the Northeast. Although this is certainly not the explosive growth that other parts of the country have been experiencing, new cases are approximately 20% higher this week than they were for the last week of June, which should give us some pause here in Vermont. Further, when we forecast out for our region, uh, looking at the four models that we've been relying on, each projects uh, future growth in our region for many of the states over the next four weeks. Although Vermont continues to perform well under each of these forecasts, some states in our region are expected to see case growth between 50 and 100 percent, with some even forecast to see higher growth than that. Again, this is something that should give us pause here in Vermont. Turning to our own data in Vermont, uh, we have seen our case growth hold steady this week with, 40, with 52 new cases reported compared to uh, 55 cases from the week before. And we also see that our reopening metrics remain stable here in Vermont as well. Our syndromic surveillance, uh, which is the uh, number of people with COVID-like symptoms that come into the emergency room or urgent care, uh, continues to remain flat, under 5% for today, and well below our 4% guardrail. The three and seven day viral growth rates also remain steady and low this week, both sitting around a half a percent. Again, this is not the sustained kind of growth that would give us concern for Vermont. Regarding our test positivity rate, our rolling average is again under 1% this week, safely below our, gu our guardrail and continuing our trend as one of the lowest positivity rates in the country. 
The fourth metric is hospital and critical care bed availability. Like last week, we've seen this ICU number trend around our 30% buffer, uh, and it has gone above that buffer again this week. But like we said last week, with our other syndromic surveillance or with our other restart metrics performing well, uh, this metric does not uh, give us pause for concern at this time. And we should point out that no one is in the ICU for COVID related illness. It's unrelated to COVID and back to a more normal uh, status prior to the pandemic for many of these hospitals. Turning now to our update regarding our travel map. We continue to see a relatively stable number of visitors who are allowed to enter Vermont for leisure travel without a quarantine this week, standing at 7.1 million visitors today. This is a slight increase of about 200,000 people from last week. We can see that there are relatively few and scattered counties across our region that saw improvement this week uh, with them moving to green status. And there are many more counties where uh, their status has worsened including many counties uh, in the Northeast. Again, although we saw an increase in the overall visitors allowed to enter th uh, the state without a quarantine, we continue to see that number reduce among the states in the Northeast that made up our original travel map, with that number peaking in late June and gradually declining over the month of July, uh, again, lowering this week uh, to about 4.4 million. Again, this is reflective of the case growth uh, we have seen across the country and the case growth which is now starting to impact the Northeast to a greater extent as well. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to the governor. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Pichek. <clears throat> as you just saw, trends in Vermont continue to hold steady keeping us in a good position to keep our economy open and continue to move towards schools reopening in the fall. Even as we've opened back up, our positivity rate is frequently the lowest in the country. And right now we have fewer cases than any other state, even when adjusted for population. Importantly, we haven't lost a Vermonter to this virus in well over a month. This is the result of having one of the strongest and most nimble testing and contact tracing programs in the country. The hard work of our health department and emergency management teams, and especially Vermonters' willingness to follow guidance and stay safe. I wanna thank everyone uh, for doing all they can to suppress this virus and help us contain the small number of outbreaks we've had to prevent it from gaining much traction. You stayed home when it was required, limited your travel, stayed home when sick, kept your distance from others as we've opened back up, and many have worn masks to protect yourself and others. At these news conferences and on social media, we've heard many reports of non-compliance, but our numbers show Vermonters have stepped up to keep each other safe which has become known as the Vermont way. With our low numbers and other considerations, I've waited to implement a mass mandate thus far. I preferred to focus on education, helping Vermonters understand why they should wear a mask, which is to protect their neighbors and themselves and keep Vermont open so they can make the right choice on their own. And I still believe that's been the right approach to date. But looking at the situation in the South and West and knowing we'll have more people coming to Vermont and more Vermonters inside as the weather gets colder, we need to be sure we're protecting the gains we've made. Because as I've said before, we all want to keep moving forward. No one wants to retreat, especially me. So, as our data and modeling just showed, the outbreaks across the nation may be spreading back towards us. And while we're in much better shape than the West and South, those states that are trending poorly or where we're watching with caution are inching Northeast, closer and closer to the region, and therefore closer to our borders. I want to assure you while these trends and projections are concerning, 
we're still in very good shape as a state. But it is time to prepare. Rather than waiting like other states have until it's too late, I feel we need to act now to protect our gains, which has allowed us to reopen the economy. This is a much better approach than having to roll things back like they've done in states like California and Texas. That's why today I signed an order that will take effect August 1, which will strengthen our current mask mandates. This change will require, rather than recommend, masks be worn in public places, both indoor and outdoor, where physical distancing is not possible. This means public places of all types, including grocery stores, pharmacies, gas stations, convenience stores, hardware stores, and other business settings when you come in contact with others. As well, this order requires masks or cloth face coverings be worn outside if you cannot keep a six foot distance from others. This order applies to everyone over the age of two, but there are some exceptions. For example, Masks are not required when eating or drinking, during strenuous exercise or activity, or for any child or adult with a medical or de developmental issue that is complicated by a facial covering. And I want to be clear, and this speaks to the point I've been trying to make for weeks, this is a difficult policy to enforce. A person who declines to wear a mask because of health concerns or difficulty breathing will not be required to produce documentation or other evidence because doing so would clearly be a violation of their health care privacy rights. To help us with our education campaign, businesses, nonprofits, and government entities are required to notify customers or clients of this change. This may include, but is not limited to, posting signs that masks or cloth face coverings are required. And I want to be clear about this. Businesses can refuse to serve people who are not wearing masks. While the benefit of wearing a mask to help reduce transmission has become more and more apparent, getting people to actually wear them is what really matters. Because of, as I've said all along, mandating masks doesn't make it so. That's why we'll continue to move forward with our education campaign, because reducing the spread of the virus and keeping Vermont healthy and open is the goal. And to accomplish this, we need everyone who can wear a mask to do so. Unfortunately, this issue has become polarized, and I'm still worried that a mandate will create conflict and resistance. So I want to take a moment to talk to folks on both sides of this issue. First, I want to acknowledge there are some who can't wear a mask for health reasons like asthma or even claustrophobia. And there are times when a mask isn't necessary, even under this mandate. So let's give each other the benefit of the doubt. For those Vermonters who don't fall into this category, but have resisted wearing a mask, I'm asking you to look at the data, the real data, not just something you see on Facebook and realize that the science is real and that wearing a mask will not only protect the gains we've made, but also help your family members and friends stay healthy. Even the president, who's been a skeptic, is now convinced masks will help get us through this. In fact, the CDC has said the surge in the Sun Belt, places that previously resisted masks, could be controlled in four to six weeks if disciplined enough to wear a mask. So if we want our kids to go back to school, if we want the place we work or eat or shop to stay open, if we want our health care system and hospital beds available when we need help, then wearing a mask or physically separating is the best way to do that. So please, help us out. Not because it's mandated, but because it's the right thing to do.
for our seniors, for our kids, for our own health, and for our economy. I'm asking you to take personal responsibility because we must continue to fight these battles in order to win this war. And each of us has a role to play in our success. And to those of you already wearing masks that are concerned about those who aren't, I ask you to give them the benefit of the doubt because attacking, shaming, and judging isn't going to help. But understanding, educating, meeting people where they are, and maybe using a little kindness and understanding might. Let's not make the news with screaming matches caught on video. Let's do things the Vermont way by being role models and leading by example. Because again, the smarter we are and the more good choices we each make and the more personal responsibility that each of us takes, the better off we'll be and the easier it will be to defeat this virus. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Green for a health update. Good morning. Vermont is still fortunate to have low levels of virus in our communities, but low is not the same as none. We still expect to see cases of COVID-19 and work quickly to contain them. To do that, we reach out to people who test positive and their close contacts to provide guidance, including staying at home to prevent further spread of the virus. I have no new news to report now regarding any of the outbreaks that we have been following or any of the non-outbreaks we have been discussing either. The policy of containment continues to work. The regional and national data that Commissioner Pichak has reported on today continues to be of great concern to the Department of Health. We empathize greatly with those parts of the country that are less fortunate than Vermont at this time. Because our triad of no deaths since June 16th, lowest number of new cases, and lowest percent positivity rate creates some reason for optimism that news outlets have picked up upon, to some extent nationally and even internationally, I thought I would share with you what I tell others are four possible explanations for this performance. First and foremost is Vermonters' cooperation and compliance and their prioritization of health, as evidenced by our frequent rankings in the top states uh, for healthiest state, often first. Second, our belief in a policy of protecting the most vulnerable, especially since a slight majority of the Vermont deaths have occurred inside of long-term care facilities like nursing homes. And I've discussed here previously the strict protocols that we've implemented to protect those residents. And we certainly credit the directors and staff of those facilities for working with us on instituting these intense measures to protect the vulnerable populations they care for. And we credit the families who have sacrificed so much in terms of visiting their loved ones. Third is the fact we did not reopen until we had a sufficient level of virus suppression in our state. We began the reopening process cautiously and only when we had a sustained decrease in new cases and an adequate level of virus suppression. And lastly, the very phased and gradual reopening of our state. This coupled with the virus suppression we've achieved through the cooperation and hard work of all Vermonters has led to less active cases, which means less opportunity for hospitalizations and serious life-threatening illness. We, of course, continue to ask Vermonters to protect one another by keeping a six-foot distance from others, wearing a face mask, washing hands, and staying home when sick. If you do travel, know when you need to quarantine. As always, if you're concerned about your health, please consult with your health care provider. 
As the governor has just said, the decision on mandatory masking was not taken lightly, and we know it will not be welcomed by everyone. But in the end, government does take responsibility and reasonable actions to protect the health and safety of all those who live in our wonderful little state. Public health takes responsibility for making recommendations that help government make decisions that are data-driven and science-based. And in that vein, we truly do believe that a mask mandate is reasonable, especially given the red zones that are, uh, we are seeing expanding all around us daily and encroaching now on the Northeast. We know that mask wearing can substantially slow the spread of virus, but only if a substantial majority of the population who is able to does so. Mask wearing, in combination with other simple actions, will prevent disease and save lives. If each one of us who's able to wear a mask and keep a safe distance from others who are not in our household, if each one of us will wash our hands a lot and stay home when we're feeling sick or when we've recently been in close contact with someone who has had COVID, we can avoid the resurgence of disease we're seeing in these other states. There's been evidence for some time that wearing a mask lowers the risk that you will spread COVID to others. And we know so much more now about asymptomatic and especially what I have termed pre-symptomatic transmission in those 48 important hours before one knows that they're ill but could transmit the virus to someone else. Newer evidence is also suggesting that a mask might protect you yourself from getting the virus at all or from getting more severe disease. As the governor stated, not everyone is able to wear a mask, many for medical reasons. And you won't necessarily be able to tell who is able to or who is not able to wear a mask. So we must all be understanding and avoid the temptation to judge or shame. One of the many reasons we wear a mask is to protect others who cannot this will support the continued opening of our economy. It will help shop owners, businesses, farmers, suppliers to stay in business. It protects the health of the frontline workers and it relieves them of the burden of reminding clients about what is now the state's mandate. We will continue our campaign to promote mask wearing and to educate the public because with or without a mandate, the fact is, we rely on each other to take this virus very seriously and keep in mind all the reasons why it's important to take all precautions if we want to get through this pandemic and get back to our more normal lives faster. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Uh, with that, we'll open it up to questions. We'll uh, start in the room as usual, Calvin. Uh, thank you. So, uh, Governor, I guess I kind of have to bounce the question back to you. So, compliance, um, how, how, what sort of fines or penalties could people face if they walk into a business and they say, I'm not going to wear a mask, you can't make me? What, what kind of fines? Yeah, I, again, we, uh, we know that compliance is going to be difficult, enforcement is even more difficult. Um, so, we're going to continue with the education process. Uh, we haven't put a a fine structure in place at this point in time. Uh, again, we just want people to do the right thing, uh, get prepared for this and understand uh, that it's in the best interest of all of us. We'll get through this a lot quicker if everyone does the right thing. So uh, again, with our education campaign that we uh, put in, we'll, we'll see more and more this week as a matter of fact. We put it into place uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, but, uh, but it's gaining momentum and uh, we're hoping between that and this, uh, this mandate and with uh, everyone trying to pull in the same direction that we'll get through this without having uh, the controversy of a, of a fine structure. But, but that could be implemented at any time if we, if we see it necessary. But uh, I don't believe that that's uh, going to be the case. And in looking at the travel map, maybe this is a question for Commissioner Kichek, but it looks like in Ohio, for instance, there's only, I think, five, four or five counties that people can actually travel from without a quarantine. So I'm wondering at what point do we roll back the travel? Well, we're doing that on a weekly basis. I mean, it is being rolled back uh, county by county. So if we see uh, an area, uh, that, you know, I look at the map 
and look at the data uh, on a daily basis. And uh, that's what gave me cause for concern and thought it necessary that we take a different approach. Uh, because uh, when you look at uh, Ohio and Pennsylvania and Virginia uh, and states that actually have uh, mass mandates um, and they're starting to, to go in the other direction, uh, it gives me uh, concern. So uh, we'll be tightening that up as we move forward. We'll do it county by county. Following up a little bit on the mandate, um, it sounds like education is still the primary uh, focus, and um, there's great hope that Vermonters will follow suit. Um, what what would be, I guess, uh, the hope to come out of instating the mandate? It sounds like the approach with education will continue. Um, so, in, in, in short, what uh, what do you hope would be different about instating the mandate? You know. Uh, I've talked with uh, a lot of people over the last couple of weeks about uh, what we should be doing because I truly believe that education guidance is the best, best approach, uh, giving people the flexibility to do the right thing. And uh, we, we are very, we're highly compliant here uh, in, the, in the state. Uh, but, uh, but hearing uh, some who uh, have, uh, have reached out and, and have made the argument that um, while they may be a bit embarrassed in some respects, to wear a mask, be the only one going into uh, a store maybe, and, and being the only one with a mask has, has given them pause. Uh, they don't want to be the first. Um, so uh, they said, you know, it'd be a lot easier if we had a mandate, uh, and then we could at least maybe blame someone. Uh, and if that rests on my shoulders, uh, and we get better compliance, and we get through this quicker, uh, I'll take that responsibility. But it did have an effect on me uh, that that, um, that was, that was a consideration, uh, that people needed a backstop. They needed a reason to do it. Not enough uh, that uh, they didn't understand enough that it could protect others, but they just needed uh, to, to, again, um, be forced to do so, even when they really wanted to. So um, we'll try this one. I, I think it's going to work. Uh, timing is everything in every endeavor. Everything that we do uh, to be successful uh, is, uh, is as much a timing issue as anything else. So. Uh, with the campaign that we've uh, that we rolled out, um, what we're seeing across the country uh, is, uh, and, and with more science uh, coming out and, and and you know giving us a little bit more information as to why uh, the masks are so important, I think uh, I, I think we're we're peaking at the right time. We're doing it at the right time, and I think we'll be successful. Sure. And on a, on a different note, the uh, the federal supplement, the $600 unemployment supplement, is expiring this week. Um, there's you know, plenty of reminders who've lost jobs, and um, this is going to hit them. Um, is have, you know, have you got a response, or does the state have any plans to be able to try and fill that void? Or we, even we don't have the we don't have the resources to fill that void. Uh, to be perfectly honest, um, this is going to be up to the federal government. I know that the. Uh, they're debating this in Congress as we speak. I, th I believe um, from some of the conversations I've had with other governors uh, and, and our, our congressional delegation that there's a possibility that something will come into place uh, before uh, this expires. And um, so we'll see. But I, I don't believe it'll be $600 if it is uh, reinstated. It'll be at a lower value. But Unemployment is still available uh, to anyone, the traditional unemployment, and the PUA is still available for those uh, who need it. Uh, but the, uh, the $600 supplement will expire unless uh, Congress takes action. Senator, given the updated travel map that's right behind you, um, does it concern you that as things start to close in on Vermont, that uh, obviously we're seen as a, a destination place where you can go where you're fairly safe. Does that concern you that uh, that may be the undoing of the state right now as far as our Well, I don't, I don't believe it has to be our undoing in some respects. Uh, that's why I'm taking the step today, uh, implementing the mandate on, on mass, because I, I want to be able to stay open. I want us to continue to be the safest state in the country with the lowest number of positive cases, the lowest positivity rate in the country. We have so much going for us. And to protect that, I felt it necessary to implement the, the mandatory mask policy today. Um, so we'll continue to watch the data uh, to inform uh, the traveling public so we don't 
uh, bring more of the virus into the state uh, unknowingly. And, um, but I believe, um, again, we'll just keep, keep track of this. It is concerning uh, to see the outliers. And again, I want to reiterate, we're, we're in good shape here in the state. We're in good shape within you know, a, a five, six, seven hour, uh, nine hour drive at this point. Uh, and that's typically uh, where we're seeing a lot of travel you know, from our friends uh, in Massachusetts and, and uh, New York and so forth. Their numbers are still good. Uh, so we're we're in we're still in good shape. Yeah, and one for doctor, if, if I can. Sure. Uh, is the department concerned right now, uh, given the testing, um, and given these given these private companies are now coming in and they're they're trying to get a piece of the testing pie, so to speak? Um, and as you stated, the uh, the particular test they're using is not necessarily accurate right now. Um, as they fight for those dollars, uh, are you concerned that it becomes more of a business rather than uh, public health issue? I think you've got a couple questions linked together there. Uh, so clearly testing is a business for, for many commercial firms. Um, but it is clearly out of a public health issue. We are, if I can try to dissect your question a little, we remain concerned about testing resources, supply chains, um, all the components that I've laboriously laid out in the past from collecting a specimen to actually processing them in the lab and, and getting a result. Um, so we are paying extra special attention to that literally every day of the week right now and working across the state with our partners in healthcare systems, with our partners who are um, needing testing, but also providing the testing uh, and have the laboratories uh, to make sure that we have a diversified portfolio across the state and to make sure that if there are places where the supply chain is weak, we at least have places to balance, counterbalance that uh, in a big way. Um, another part of your question had to do with sort of the different types of tests because we've got the PCR test, which is the mainstay of what we do, and then the antigen test. And the antigen test, I'm sure we will still begin to start seeing more and more of as uh, it becomes better known. And I do believe there will be an appropriate place uh, in a state's testing strategy for those tests. Um, and we will, uh, we've been discussing that all along in terms of uh, how they can be utilized in a high risk setting and with a symptomatic patient population to help make decisions very quickly. Uh, so if there's a nursing home resident who's in a state that has a high prevalence of COVID and that patient has all the symptoms of COVID and you can get that result in 15 minutes, that can do wonders for how the nursing home behaves with regard to isolation, quarantine, who's in contact with who, which staff take care of that patient, and how they don't take care of any other patients, et cetera. Uh, so they can be very valuable. Less valuable if you're just trying to generally screen a bunch of people who don't feel badly and are in a state with very low prevalence. So we just have to find that sweet spot in between. Well, and, and these various businesses that are looking to be uh, partners, um, are you worried that uh, maybe the, the business end of things becomes a little bit more uh, important than necessarily the testing? Yeah, no, th th I don't worry about that so much. The thing that I'm worried about the most, and this morning the governor was actually telling us from phone calls he's had with other governors, that the turnaround time for results from some of these companies, which wasn't traditionally bad, has become overstressed by the surges all around the country. And with those surges come way more requests for tests. And to handle the volume of those tests has created backlogs for them. And what might have been returned in 48 hours is now five days later. Uh, and that's really not acceptable at a time when you need to make quick decisions from a policy perspective and from a healthcare perspective because your state is experiencing a surge. So that's, that's what concerns me and um, much of the country the most right now. Okay, we'll go to the phone now. Wilson Ring, EAP. Um, hi, good morning, everybody. 
Happy Friday. Um, I have two questions here. Um, as we see the, apparently the virus moving back into the Northeast, not that it's ever left completely, but that it seems to be getting worse again. Is that the, uh, is that the beginning of the uh, second wave we've been talking about for so long since it first started? And then secondly, my other question is, um, the president was saying, I don't know recently, I don't know exactly when, but he said that the administration has, that there are zero unfulfilled requests from states for any sort of equipment, PPE or ventilators or whatever. Does Vermont have any unfulfilled requests from the federal government that are outstanding right now? And those are my two questions. Well, great. Uh, Wilson, I'm going to ask, uh... Uh, Commissioner Levine to answer the first part, first question, and maybe uh, Commissioner Sherling could answer the second question in terms of PPE and inventory. Thank you. Good morning, Wilson. Uh, you're very upbeat this morning. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. The um, most of the country we don't believe is in uh, the second wave. It's the first wave never really went away. Um, I would have to say if all of a sudden Vermont had a major wave, I might call that a resurgence in Vermont. And the reason I say that is just again because our, our, our percent positivity rates and our case rates are so low that the virus truly has entered a state of, if you will use the word, suppression here in Vermont for a fairly prolonged time, which has allowed the state to reopen in so many ways. And so if we saw a dramatic spike, I would call that a resurgence. But I think most uh, public health officials are calling what's going on in the country uh, a continuation uh, of something that was going on from March that never really got to the level of suppression that it needed to before a lot of very dramatic reopening activities occurred in various places. So that's how I would answer that. I'll turn the rest okay, over so, to Commissioner Sherwood. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Good afternoon, Wilson. If I, uh, if I understood the question, it was two part uh, general overview of our, our PPE uh, inventory and then uh, unfulfilled federal orders. Is that correct? Yeah, but pretty much. Yes. Okay. Um, in general, our PPE stocks in the warehouse are good. Now, keep in mind that. Uh, those are emergency reserves that we're trying to build up to uh, a six-month total reserve. I think on average we've got about 100 days stock uh, on average of the various uh, types of, of PPE material. Uh, and those range all the way down to 50 or 60 days, all the way up to um, some things are in stock for over a year uh, based on current burn rate. Relative to uh, federal orders, We'll never be in a position until the pandemic ends where all federal orders are fulfilled. We have uh, rolling uh, requests for uh, personal protective equipment uh, that are being filled on a, on a weekly basis by the federal government. So does that mean um, you have unfulfilled requests from, of the federal government? I mean, it's kind of, um, we're fact checking the president here, so I wanna be as precise as possible with that. Right now, you yeah. have a fulfilled request from the federal government. Can you tell me what those are? Well, I'm not sure I characterize them necessarily as unfulfilled because they're rolling requests for ongoing supply to build the stockpile. Um, and in order, in order to tell you what the outstanding requests are, uh, we'd have to put together a, a quick brief for you. So we'd have to get back to you on that piece. Um, okay, great. Thank you very much, all of you. Kevin McCollum, seven days. Hi, Governor, can you hear me? We can. So I guess my first question is, can you explain why you favor an educational approach towards the wearing of masks, given that you were very um, willing early on in the pandemic to make uh, travel restrictions for non-essential employees mandatory. Uh, you didn't you didn't show any compunction or hesitation about requiring people to stay home instead of just encouraging them to stay home. Um, why that hesitation till now on the on the map? Yeah, it's been it's like a behavior change. Behavior change is difficult. 
uh, to accomplish. Um, those were almost like structural changes. Uh, when you uh, close down a business, it's, it's a structural change. Um, behavior change, like, like shaking hands. Think about uh, six months ago, would you have ever thought that we'd stop shaking hands? Took a while. It took uh, probably a couple months before people became accustomed to not doing so. Um, the reaction is when you when you encounter someone, is to shake their hand. But we've we've gotten through that. Um, wearing masks is is something that is uh, is a little bit more difficult, as we've seen again across the country and and seen how uh, politically polarized this has become uh, by a, a number of different factors. So. Uh, that's what I was sensitive to, and, I, and I've always believed uh, that uh, you get more when you lead rather than drive, um, and trying to force someone to do, mandate something, uh, doesn't always, uh, you're not always successful, but if you can convince somebody to do the right thing uh, by leading by example and educating, um, that you have far better results, and, 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 uh, and I think that that's, uh, that's part of why I've been resistant. and. Seeing our data, uh, you know, we've we've been moving in the right direction for quite some time, and again, I've stated this on a on a twice weekly basis. Where I'm very proud of where Vermont is and how much we've accomplished. Even though we had, you know, we're within a five-hour uh, distance driving distance of uh, New York City, uh, and New York City uh, had 35,000 deaths, and uh, and that was the epicenter of the pandemic. And Boston, uh, another area of great concern, you know, almost 9,000 deaths. And, uh, and, and again, that's within a two-hour driving uh, period. So we've been able to accomplish a great deal by doing the right thing. And, uh, and we've been able to, again, have high compliance, uh, but we need more compliance right now. Uh, we need to make sure uh, that uh, the more we've learned about this, the better off we'll be if we, if we mask up. And, uh, and I believe that uh, timing is everything. And again, with more data, more science, more education, uh, as well as uh, making this, uh, this mandatory, I think we'll get, uh, we'll get a little bit higher compliance. And that's what we need right now, to get, prepare ourselves. It's just, this isn't a time to panic. We have time. Uh, we've been able to look forward. We're seeing you know, the migration. We're watching this heat map. We're watching how it's coming back towards us. And it's just the right time to better prepare ourselves for what could happen and uh, to prevent it from happening. Okay, thanks. I, I appreciated your remarks anticipating, you know, some conflict uh, potentially in the community. Um, but it, um, what do you, what, what guidance would you give to a shopper who is out and about um, and wearing a mask like they should, and they encounter someone who doesn't wear a mask and they don't know whether that person has a medical condition or not. Would you counsel them to say something, um, ignore it? Yeah, um, I, I would. Uh, I would, count, I would talk counsel to the shop owner. Yeah, I would counsel them to avoid it. Avoid that person. Not come in within six feet of that person. Just try and avoid the situation. Okay, and and then I guess the last question is related to that. Is uh, so. Um, it seems like there might be some conflict between the um, shop owners or business owners who are requiring people to wear masks and yet some people who have medical conditions um, still need to shop. Um, what, what does that person do with a medical condition who, who walks up to a store door that says mask required? Do they, do they call the shop? Do they knock? Do they walk in anyway? Um, what are they supposed to do? Yeah, I, I would say that they would walk in anyway. Uh, they might want to tell uh, the shopkeeper or whoever is there um, that they have a medical condition if they want to, um, but it's not required. Obviously, privacy is of great concern. So it's a delicate balance, uh, admittedly, Kevin. This isn't, this isn't easy. Uh, there will be some controversy. Uh, even in places where, I mean, we see, I'm sure uh, you've been through the city of Burlington, who has had uh, a mass mandate for quite some time now, and there are people there who uh, don't adhere to that policy. Uh, we're going to see the same thing uh, throughout the state. But again, I'm hoping um, that uh, the more people who wear them, the more people who lead by example, uh, the more compliance we'll have. Okay, thank you very much, Governor.
Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thank you, Ethan. Uh, Governor, I was just wondering, what impact do you think your mandatory mask order will have on schools? Uh, if you talk to the superintendents, specifically organized sports, and, and obviously the fall season coming up with football, and you know, we put other things like drama and other close uh, student activities, and just wondering why, like goggles, are not being mandated or shielded because tear ducts obviously are impacted on something like this. Yeah, I think if you, you know, I, I might ask uh, Dr. Levine to comment, but uh, but I think the reason that goggles uh, are not required uh, because that's where the the droplets might might um, come into your your system uh, rather than emit from your system. So um, what we're trying to do is make sure everyone masks up in order to prevent that from happening. But. We don't know what's going to happen uh, at this point in time. We're having conversations about fall sports as we speak. Right now, we're trying to focus on in-person instruction first. That's the, our highest priority in some sort of uh, hybrid system or uh, getting to a point where we have uh, full in-person instruction, I think, is the best approach and, the, and the best for our kids. Uh, so we'll continue to, uh, to focus on that. But, uh, but sports are important as well uh, for all kinds of reasons, as well as uh, drama and the arts and so forth. So uh, we want to get back to, as, to back to normal as quick as possible. Uh, that's why, again, implementing this uh, mass mandate uh, might help us get us there uh, to prevent the spread in uh, other locations back at home and so forth. So, uh, Dr. Levine, anything that uh, you can add to that? Dr. Levine is, uh, it thinks it's the I answer has been amazed. okay. I was amazed but watching, watching uh, somebody sent me a video of a Vermont football camp with a blocking drill where the players were blocking handheld blocking pads, only to have the person holding the pads, handing it to the sweating player to just block them and hold it for the next person. And they're just passing it down the line that, as they're all sweating and breathing uh, and everything like that. No mask, no nothing. Uh, and, and I'm thinking Dr. Levine probably would uh, give them an A for uh, proper handling. Yeah, you know, it is problematic. And again, uh, enforcement only goes so far. And uh, we have said uh, that there are allowances for strenuous activity and, and, uh, and, and sports and athletic, athletics and when you're working out and so forth. So. Um, we just want people to do the right thing. And so when we're considering uh, fall sports, there's going to be some activities that are, are not going to happen this year, to be perfectly blunt. Okay. Thank you very much. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Yes, good morning. Um, I'm just wondering what the, I realize this is, is an educational piece primarily. But what are the consequences if somebody continuously um, ignores the mandate, if they defy the, the mass mandate? I mean, what, what do you tell those folks? And if you can't do anything, then why uh, mandate it in the first place? Well, again, uh, trying to lead by example, uh, trying to uh, give uh, reasons for people to try enforcement on their own, putting up signs in businesses, uh, making it a requirement. Um, allowing businesses to make uh, decisions on their own about whether they serve or don't serve someone. They, they do have the ability under this executive order to not serve someone who, uh, who comes in without a reason uh, to, uh, to, to, who is not wearing a mask. Um, so again, not a perfect system, uh, but uh, we need more compliance. We need more people wearing masks in all um, walks of life. So uh, we think that's the right approach. Uh, and if we have to do something more uh, with enforcement, we'll, we'll do so. But uh, let's try the education piece along with the uh, mass mandate and see how that goes. Uh, I believe uh, that we'll be successful uh, in, that, uh, in that regard with this approach. But, but um, we'll just have to play it by ear, so to speak, and, and take other measures if we have to. Okay, thank you. Aaron Pateko, PG Digger. Hi, 
Hi. Um, school districts have been releasing their reopening plans this week, and it looks like most, if not all, are adopting a hybrid schedule with days of in-person instruction and days for remote learning. Many, if not most, districts appear that students will be receiving more than two days of in-person instruction. Does the governor support the approach schools are taking so far? Well, again, I'm hoping uh, that at some point we'll go to full instruction, full in-person instruction. Uh, but we have to start somewhere. And uh, I know there's a lot of apprehension uh, across from, from uh, teachers and administrators and, and kids and, and parents. Uh, so maybe this is the first step. So I, uh, I uh, accept uh, that we, we need to, again, start somewhere. And uh, this might be the right approach. A hybrid approach is something that we're offering. We have to prove ourselves, and and uh, and it might uh, again uh, allow us to go to more in-person instruction. The more successful we are, but it's uh, it, okay, you know, it gets you. it gets back to the the district and the schools to make that determination on their own. Are you all set, Aaron? Uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, thanks. Uh, Kat, WCAX. Hi, so I had a viewer who wanted to know how the increases in cases around our region and in Vermont compares to our increase in testing. So I think they want a little bit of context about whether we're just catching more cases now or whether there are more cases now. Um, I'll let Dr. Levine and or Commissioner Pichak answer that. But we, again, we still have a very low positivity rate. So that's the, the common denominator here. In a different time, we would stand to, as a trio and say exactly what was just said. Um, because that has become a controversial point around the country, and it's been in the evening news a lot, I know. Uh, but we're very comfortable that we're testing a combination of people who really feel the need to be tested because they don't feel well or have a specific symptom, as well as people who are getting tested because there's a reason they need testing, whether they work in a sector that cares for vulnerable people, whether they are traveler and want to know if they need to continue a quarantine, whether they're a Vermonter who's left the state and is coming back, etc. So, and then there's people who are being tested who just want to know, uh, and they actually have no symptoms at all. So testing those diverse populations with good numbers, over 1,000 a day for sure, about 11,000 a week, many weeks, allows us to really feel comfortable that we're getting a great sample of Vermont. And with our positivity rate, as Commissioner Pichek said, being below 1%, um, that has to indicate that there's a low level of virus in our communities not being freely transmitted amongst people all of the time. So I think that's very, very comforting, if you will, in that regard. Um, I was going to say one other thing, and I forgot, but do you have a comment to make as well? Uh, thank you, Dr. Levine. I'm just going to talk about outside of Vermont. I think that was part of the question as well. And certainly across the country, we've seen uh, new cases uh, outpacing increases in testing. Um, we keep a close eye on the positivity rates of the states that are around us. Many in New England have low positivity rates, but some of them have seen uh, increases as well, which again would, would lead to indicate that the increases that we're seeing in our region aren't just due to increased testing, but a, a greater spread of the virus as well. Quick follow-up for Dr. Levine probably. Are we testing too many people? Um, I asked because I was talking with um, the head of the microbiology clinical lab at U University of Vermont Medical Center, and they were saying, you know, we're, you know, we can have 1,300 tests come through our door each day, and, you know, getting through all of them can be challenging. Um, and they, there's a little bit of a, a question of, are we testing it at this point too many people? Yeah, very understandable. I wonder if you had any, any, yeah, any reaction to that. Yeah, very understandable question. Before I answer it, I remembered what I wanted to say for the previous question, which is, you know, we just had an experience where we essentially tested a huge sample of Bennington and Wyndham counties 
uh, to try to figure out if there was something going on down there and you know, tested over 1,600 people and only found five positives in that population. Uh, so that again gives us greater comfort in thinking that we're comfortably testing enough people to know what's going on and what's not going on and are we accurately reflecting what's going on in the population we think we are. Now when it comes to your other question about uh, are we testing too much, I would say the answer is no. If you look at uh, the most expert guidelines that have been given to states um, by those not only in the federal government like CDC but uh, Harvard researchers and others who have really tried to analyze this problem closely and we are now slightly exceeding the number of tests that our state should have on a daily basis. Uh, it was around 900 something, close to 1,000 tests a day. So we're slightly exceeding that, which is fine. Uh, I think that's right. The only time I would say we should be concerned is if we're in a state where the supply chain has been disrupted, as we talked uh, in an earlier question. And if all of a sudden, we're back to where we were in March, where there's a dearth of uh, chemical reagents or collection kits or what have you for testing, then we'd have to very strictly reanalyze our policy and our procedures. Um, right now, we are actually looking at some of those things, though. Again, trying to be ahead of the ball, uh, making sure that if something's coming our way and if the country is really um, running into trouble with having adequate testing supplies or adequate turnaround times, uh, are there ways we can conserve now uh, to protect ourselves later? And I don't mean radically changing what we're doing in testing, just modifying some protocols that may have had very little yield so we can look at the data and go, very little yield testing this population of people, maybe we should do less of that to uh, conserve our supplies. But at the moment, we're, we're not changing. So we're not concerned that we're creating a backlog in case in testing with um, a lot of asymptomatic cases? Not right today, but obviously watching that closely for the future. Thank you. Thanks, Kat. Paul Hines, seven days. Hi, Governor. I have a few questions about the death of inmate Kenneth Johnson uh, last December at Northern State Correctional Facility. The Office of the, of the Defender General has alleged that the Department of Corrections and its contractor ignored Mr. Johnson's pleas for help and, in fact, threatened and restrained him as he was gasping for breath and dying. Do you believe the state is responsible for Mr. Johnson's death? Well, first of all, anyone in our custody, custody uh, we have a responsibility to take care of. And uh, this was a very tragic incident. Um, we're trying to get to the bottom of it as we speak. Uh, we've, we're asking uh, um, an entity to do a private investigation uh, to see what happened um, and uh, make sure that it doesn't happen again. But uh, again, very concerning. Uh, I don't uh, take this uh, lightly and uh, we're trying to get to the bottom of it. I might ask uh, Secretary Smith uh, to expand on that, he's being that he's right here. Paul, thank you for the question. Obviously, we are responsible if, in fact, um, that person is in our custody, like Mr. Johnson was. You know, I've sat at this, uh, st stood at this pro podium. I haven't sat, although I am height challenged. Um, I will, and I've publicly praised uh, departments in my agency when they do a good job, and you'll see it done numerous times. I've done it with um, Dr. Levine in the health department and also the Department of Corrections in terms of their response to the coronavirus during the pandemic, and they really did a, a great job. But I've also been critical uh, publicly when we don't get things right, and we didn't get this right. There is no excuse, in my opinion, for someone in our custody to be medically misdiagnosed with a cancerous tumor that went that grew 
and was undetected in a man's throat. Subsequently, it killed Mr. Johnson, as you had said on uh, December 6th or 7th, I believe. Um, so this concerns me on several levels. Um, could we have provided better medical care? And the answer is absolutely yes. We are, as you know, we're changing, we've changed our medical providers. Did the medical people and correction supervisors respond sufficiently? And I have my doubts. Uh, but there are several independent uh, investigations ongoing. Um, most of them have concluded, but I've asked Tris Coffin and his team to take a look at this uh, incident up in, um, in, in Newport. Um, I have also asked Jim Baker to take a close look at ourselves in the mirror on this and ask the question, did we do everything we could of in this case? And um, we need to look ourselves in the mirror and make that judgment whether we did. I don't think we did. And since this prisoner was African American, then we have to ask the hard question and look ourselves in the mirror and say, would we have handled this prisoner differently if he was white? And so, uh, you know, those, to sort of follow up on your question, we are responsible for this, and we should take responsibility. There, there is no excuse for this. And the other thing that I just want to say is we need to, we need to turn these investigations around faster. Um, now, COVID interfered with this investigation, but to go seven months uh, with, uh, with investigations going on, uh, we need both us as an agency and external entities need to turn these around uh, faster so that we can, we can expose these sort of instances as quick as we can. I answer your question, Paul. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, I, I just would like to restate the question again to the governor, uh, which, which you have answered, Secretary Smith, but I'd like for the governor to answer it. Uh, do you, Governor, believe the state is responsible for Mr. Johnson's death? And I would also add, uh, do you believe, as uh, Secretary Smith just indicated, that Mr. Johnson's race may have played a role in his death? Yeah, well, I'd like to see uh, the results of the investigation before I come to that determination on either counts. Um, but um, I would add uh, there's, and maybe Dr. Levine could even expand on this, there are misdiagnoses uh, that happens every single day uh, throughout the healthcare system. It's just something that happens, it's not perfect, and it does happen. Um, but um, but we, we have a responsibility to follow up on this. and. And I would hope uh, the race uh, didn't uh, play a factor in this, uh, but I can't say for certain that it did not, uh, because we know that racism um, is is a is apparent uh, throughout our country, but here in Vermont as well. And um, and if so, we have to uh, take responsibility for that. Governor, are you suggesting this is a run-of-the-mill misdiagnosis? No. I mean, it's, it's from, from no. the report from. From the report, if I could finish, sir, the report suggests that this man was uh, banging on the windows, yelling and screaming for help uh, for hours and was ignored. Uh, that seems to go beyond misdiagnosis, no? Yeah, I would agree. Um, this, this isn't, there isn't anything about this case that's run of the mill. Uh, but I'm just saying, I'd like to get through the investigation. I'd like to get the information first. Uh, before I comment further on that and take full responsibility for it. But I just want to make sure that, uh, that we have all the information. But uh, certainly from what I've seen thus far, it appears that we made a tremendous amount of mistakes along the way. The, the uh, Defender General has also alleged that the DOC was, quote, complicit in covering up its contractor's gross failure to provide life-saving medical care. Can you, Governor, respond to that charge against the well, DOC? Well, again, I don't know what he's basing that on, uh, what investigation that he performed to, to uh, come to that conclusion. But uh, again, we'll see what the entity uh, that we have uh, contracted with to give us that independent investigation 
comes up with. And if they come to that conclusion, then we'll take responsibility. Governor, do you have anything to say to Mr. Johnson's family? Yeah, well, again, um, it's a tragic, tragic situation. And uh, obviously, um, we can't let this happen. And it's, it's, it's a black eye for us uh, for it to happen at all uh, when someone is in our custody. Uh, and uh, and I, you know, extremely, extremely sorry uh, for the loss uh, to the family members of someone who, again, is in our custody. We had a responsibility to take care of this person, and it appears we may have failed. Thank you, Governor. Just one final question for you, Secretary Smith, um, and then I'll, then I'll let you go. Um, you said earlier that you believe these investigations need to take place more quickly. I understand uh, there is now an external review um, taking place by Downs Rapid Martin. Um, can you clarify for me, to the best of your knowledge, the nature of any internal reviews by the Department of Corrections on this matter? The Defender General appeared to question whether one has taken place at all um, pr prior to this Downs Rapid review. Can you tell me what you know about uh, any internal review? There wasn't one, Paul, and there should have been. Uh, but. Uh, DRM will be looking at why there wasn't one uh, taking place as uh, as it should have in uh, in corrections and and I just want to also share with you I have authorized uh, Downs Rackland and Martin through their um, through their contract to share any findings that they have uh, with the U.S. Attorney and the Attorney General. If uh, if warranted, so uh, uh, we are making sure that we are sharing any of the results with the proper uh, proper authorities out there. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I may have some more questions, but I'll follow up with you offline. And thank you, Governor, for your time. Thanks, Paul. Joe Lee Sherman, Local 22, Local 44. Hi, Governor. Um, I just wanted to know. Um, uh, why now? Why is the mask mandate uh, set in place for August 1st um, as opposed to um, June or even a few weeks ago? Well, again, timing is everything. Uh, we thought we were on the right track. We are on the right track here in Vermont. Um, but, um, but as I stated weeks ago, um, we can't think of ourselves just as an island here because we're not. Uh, we are so dependent on, uh, on a region. Uh, whether it be uh, New York or Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Maine, uh, Rhode Island, uh, New Jersey, and so forth. We have a lot of visitors uh, coming to our state uh, that uh, they either have second homes here or just love the beauty of our state and want to visit. So um, seeing in the beginning, uh, we, we saw that uh, the, uh, it was getting safer. Uh, the, the travel, trusted traveler uh, portion of our modeling showed that we were actually expanding uh, the area and that we could have more people coming into the state. But what we saw, uh, again, throughout the Sun Belt, uh, the, the South and the West, and we're seeing in the Midwest right now this resurgence and intensifying yeah. of, uh, of the virus uh, has given me a pause and given me uh, some concern. So uh, I want to prepare us. Uh, again, this isn't a time to panic. We have time uh, to put this into place and prepare in, just in case this does uh, come to our borders. Uh, again, uh, this is just happening. What we're seeing is uh, some increased cases in Ohio, in Virginia, Pennsylvania, and uh, we just want to make sure uh, that we're on top of this and anticipating this uh, so that we can prevent uh, any a resurgence here in Vermont. Again, very proud of what we've done. Um, we uh, we lead the nation in a number of different areas, and I intend to keep it that way. And, and just to clarify, there's no fees or fines associated with um, people who don't comply with the mask wearing policy. No, there's not, none at this time. Are stores required to um, have signage of some sort to tell people you need a mask in order to come in? Yes, we are requiring uh, entities, uh, government entities and, and, uh, and private entities to put signage in, up uh, that, uh, that tells people that there is a uh, mask requirement. Thank you. Guy Page, Local 
Governor Times Argus reported yesterday that banks and retailers are running short of small change, in part because people aren't walking into stores as much. It was also reported yesterday that the store reporter and affiliate newspapers have had to lay off their editor and several other key news staff due to continued declining advertising. Given these canaries in the coal mine, uh, are you concerned that your mask mandate will drive consumers to buy even more online, less through in-person visits to Vermont businesses? And has your administration discussed if this increased online buying could turn into a permanent consumer choice for more Vermonters? Yeah, no, actually, Guy, I believe just the opposite. I believe that uh, if we put this into place, uh, that people will be more comforted uh, in going out, uh, that we can continue to open up the economy. I still believe that we're going to be able to open the spigot a little bit more every single week, uh, but we need people to adhere to the policy, keep themselves, keep their families, keep their friends safe, uh, and, uh, and reduce the, 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 uh, the, the transmission uh, of the virus. So I believe that this action that we're taking uh, to be um, proactive, will actually have the opposite effect and we'll be able to have more people uh, again have some faith in uh, in going out uh, to some of these uh, the stores and and do shopping and and um, actually open up the economy a little bit more okay well, thank you uh question for commissioner uh, levine um, given the false positive on antigen testing in manchester as the state public health expert are you concerned that some of the increase in large-scale positive tests nationwide could be significantly due to a problem, a similar problem with antigen testing. That's a great question. Um, not all states report antigen testing, so we believe we're a part of at least a third of the states that require confirmation of antigen testing with PCR to be reported. So again, it wouldn't account for all cases. And something very unique may have happened here in our circumstances. Uh, it's still yet to be determined. So I, I would hate to have it be generalized across all those in the country who are using this particular mode of testing, because uh, we just don't know the precise uh, explanation for it just yet. So. Uh, the, the, the antigen testing is relatively new, so the majority of testing that's been done in the country up until the last month or so has been PCR testing. So I think if it does account for any percentage, it's going to be a very small percentage uh, if there were false positives in the mix. So I'm not overly concerned about that at this time. What I'm actually more concerned about is that these machines will, uh, people will lose faith in them or uh, lose confidence, I do think they have a role, and I want that role to be uh, evident uh, as they get deployed, and when they're used appropriately, I think they can be another adjunct to our armamentarium for testing. So I really hope that uh, through the investigations that are uh, ongoing, both here and actually in Maine, in that example I cited as well, that um, we'll get some clarity and definition about that. Because again, I, I, I do think these machines will play a role in the future. Thank you. Peter Hirschfeld, CPR. Commissioner Levine, you referenced the growing body of literature that uh, shows a correlation between face, facial covering usage and reduced transmission of COVID-19. Are you familiar with any research or literature that shows face mask mandates uh, result in higher usage rates of facial coverings? I have Dr. Levine and Commissioner uh, Sherling, or I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Pichek uh, answer that as well. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really nice question to ask. Like everything with COVID-19, Everything's moving very fast. So again, uh, precise answers to questions like that are evolving. First point that everyone needs to understand, there is widespread agreement about the fact that facial coverings 
will be helpful in doing what we want them to do to prevent the transmission of COVID-19. So that needs to be accepted from the start. The more nuanced question is, is the mandating of the wearing of the facial covering something that makes even more difference than just using them at all on a more voluntary basis, we'll call it. And there is some increasing evidence now. And uh, actually, literally an hour and a half ago, I was showing the governor another study that had come out uh, recently in Health Affairs that looked at the evolving climate and the fact that many states were starting to mandate and estimated that there could be anywhere from 250 to 450,000 cases of transmission of COVID-19 that would be averted by the use of a mandatory uh, facial masking policy. Um, they looked at, they, they made that estimate based on the data they had looking at the performance of states that had, in, had um, uh, developed a policy to mandate versus those that did not and saw significant evolving changes in all of those states. Um, internationally, there's been some other data. As you know, there are countries that actually, from a cultural point of view, have made the transformation we're trying to have Vermont make uh, and, and use of masking knowing it is a behavior change that is challenging for everyone, as the governor has uh, stated today. Uh, and so other countries where this has become much more of a cultural norm, as opposed to something that we have to start consciously thinking about and doing, um, have shown success when that has been added as well. So I'm getting much more comfortable with that field of research, though I'm not mm -hmm. sure we're done yet with that because the mandating is really so recent. I'm going to ask Commissioner Pichek to add anything because he's developed some nice models uh, with his department that we've all viewed that actually uh, shed some more light on this. Uh, thank you, Dr. Levine. Yeah, so, so Peter, for your, to your first question, you know, there is limited um, surveys or limited research about the mandate and its increased compliance, but there uh, was at least one state that conducted an internal uh, polling uh, through its health department and, and then through a third party surveyor as well, and that's Colorado. And they did find in both of those surveys that mask um, compliance was up about 8 to 16 percent in counties in Colorado where there was a mandate compared to counties in Colorado where no mandate uh, had been issued, and that was part of the rationale for issuing a statewide mask mandate just last week. So, so there is limited um, you know, research, but that's one item to point to. As Dr. Levine mentioned, in terms of getting universal mask compliance, we showed some models earlier. Uh, one of them was from IHME that showed many of the states in our region um, forecasted to grow between now and November. However, each one of, our, each one of the states, including Vermont, uh, if a mask um, policy is universally adopted, meaning 95% of, of people are wearing masks when they should be in indoor locations and the like, uh, each one of those states are going to see a, a decrease uh, from where we stand now uh, in their case count. Uh, so that um, is very encouraging, uh, but we do need to get greater compliance, not just here, but across the region and the country. And then just a, a real quick follow-up for you, Governor. Um, this isn't going to be taking effect until August 1. Why the eight-day delay between your determination that this is the right policy choice for Vermont and actually putting it in place? Well, again, for a number of different reasons. First of all, um, this isn't a panic situation. Again, as I stated, this is trying to be pro proactive, uh, trying to forecast what's happening and trying to prevent uh, some transmission of, uh, of the virus, if we can, in the foreseeable Foreseeable, uh, foreseeable future uh, based on the modeling that we've seen. Uh, secondly, uh, I think we need to give uh, time uh, to some of these businesses and entities, entities to get their signage up uh, to prepare people for this, as well as uh, people individually uh, to get them prepared uh, to, to buy masks, get masks, acquire masks, make masks, um, to make sure that they're uh, fully prepared uh, as well. So again, this isn't a panic. 
this is uh, just doing the right thing and doing it, doing it like we have everything else in a measured way. If I thought uh, that this was uh, something that was uh, that was um, uh, required uh, tomorrow, obviously I would have uh, I would have mandated it today and had it effective today. Um, but <clears throat> I don't. I just don't see uh, that this is uh, uh, in that vein. And again, we'll have our we'll continue with our education program, our marketing campaign uh, that will continue and build uh, this week. You should see more of it uh, by the time this is uh, comes into effect. Thanks to all of you. Ann Wallace Allen, BJ Bigger. Hi, um, this is a question about the economy. As you know, the $600 federal unemployment supplement is going away this week. So um, it's going to start not arriving next week. And I'm wondering how is the state preparing? Um, for example, when you guys released your rental and mortgage assistance programs, officials said then that they know that's not gonna be enough money uh, we know that a lot of Vermonters have been using food shelves and food banks. So do you expect a rise in homelessness and hunger as a result of this money going away? Well, again, as I uh, said before earlier uh, in the questioning, I believe that um, I believe Congress will be taking some action this week from everything that I've heard from other governors and from our congressional delegation. I think it's just a matter of time. Uh, it may not be to the to the same uh, amount uh, that we're seeing today, but I believe that there'll be something there. And uh, and again, uh, the the implementing this uh, mass mandate, uh, I believe, allows us as well to continue to open up the economy here in Vermont. So uh, I'm hopeful uh, that we'll be able to make uh, again, based on what we see over the next week or so, uh, based on the data, uh, that uh, I may might be able to make uh, more announcements on on opening up a little bit further uh, to provide for more opportunity for people to go back to work in their regular jobs uh, because I know that there are jobs available at this point uh, as well. So I'm uh, I'm hopeful we'll get through this, but I believe that uh, Congress will take some action uh, in the next few days. Okay. okay, thank you. I have another question too. Um, it's about bias incidents. According to data from the AG's office, um, Vermont has actually seen an increase in bias incidents over the last two months. Those include hate crimes, civil harassment offenses, and um, biased speech. Um, is there anyone at the stage who's aware of this and is doing anything to deter bias incidents and hate crimes? Yeah, obviously a right uh, very volatile time for us as a country. I don't know if that would be unique uh, to Vermont. I would uh, suspect, although I have nothing to base this on, uh, that we may see a lot of this uh, throughout the country. Uh, this has become, again, another one of those polarizing issues, which shouldn't be polarizing. We should all come together as Americans and get through this uh, and uh, do the right thing. But, uh, but at the same time, uh, I believe uh, that we are seeing uh, more, again, volatility uh, in this area. Uh, Commissioner Sherling, anything uh, you could uh, add to this from a public safety standpoint? Uh, yes, Governor. Um, I haven't seen the data from the Attorney General's office, but we have sporadically seen uh, uh, events uh, being reported of this nature, and uh, some of it may be as a result of increased uh, awareness, which uh, increases reporting, which is good. Um, in terms of responding, I think, uh, you know, having Vermonters uh, embrace this conversation about racism, about bias, uh, and about all the challenges it presents uh, is the primary way to uh, respond, have communities get engaged in this conversation uh, and find ways to uh, mitigate the impact of bias and ultimately with the goal of eliminating racism. Is there something you guys are doing to, that is um, advancing that goal of having Vermonters embrace the conversation? Well, I think on a community by community basis, uh, those conversations are happening. I see uh, uh, snippets of those uh, those types of engagement processes that are happening. Uh, we are about to undertake uh, a public outreach campaign on our modernization strategies for modernizing policing and law enforcement, which is a, a, a very prominent uh, component of this work. Um, so we hope that that will uh, that effort will create opportunities for folks to engage uh, as well. As well, we've uh, we've put into place the Racial Equity Task Force, uh, 
who uh, has been meeting, uh, just gotten together, and uh, we'll look for um, some approaches there, uh, suggestions on what we can do to do better. All right, thanks so much. Steve Merrill. <clears throat> Hello, can you hear me? I can. Thank you. Uh, a couple of uh, quick ones for the doctor, and maybe a couple for the governor, if I may. How about uh, one? one how about one for each? Okay. Can we so, negotiate? Uh, uh, yeah, sure. But some, like I said, some outlets have two or three people from their outlets. But regardless, you can have two or three uh, from your outlet as well, Steve. Okay, if I'm schizophrenic, can I just pretend <laughs> that I'm another person? Anyways. Dr. Levine, what's the uh, what's the latest on on fomites? Uh, we, we were told that you know uh, that the virus could live you know a certain time on certain things, uh, and uh, it's varied. Do we know for sure how long it can live on different surfaces? I don't have that at the top of my head, but yes, we're learning more and more, um, and. You're correct. We differentiate like a hard metallic surface from uh, a piece of clothing or a cloth. Um, there are different times. Uh, I'm glad you asked the question because I'd actually like to look back at that literature a little again and, and see if there's any more certainty. So I will make a note to myself to report that. But what I do want to emphasize as a sort of theme is we know enough about what are called fomites, which are just you know inanimate objects that could transmit the disease. We know enough that um, most authorities feel that the minority of infections are transmitted that way. This does not mean stop washing your hands. Um, by, by no means does it mean that. But it means that the masking becomes even more important and the social distancing becomes even more important because if so much is transmitted in the air we all breathe, uh, those are the precautions we can take to protect ourselves from the majority of the way infections are transmitted rather than the minority, which is from objects. Okay, I, I believe the CDC told us that if we all complied and we all wore masks, that we could stamp this thing out completely in four weeks. Um, so if if we did all that and after four weeks we didn't stamp it out, should we still believe them? Absolutely, because stamping out implies the virus just disappeared from the face of the planet. And that's not a realistic outcome measure. The outcome measure we should have is, at least in Vermont, we keep our rates as low as they are, which is about as low as we can humanly go, it seems. Uh, it's very challenging to go much lower uh, at a time when too many humans retain susceptibility to this virus because they don't have any immunity. So the virus isn't going to disappear off the face of the planet. But clearly, uh, CDC was trying to, I think, tell a lot of the states that have had the worst experience recently with the virus that there is hope for them. Uh, and if they do implement all of the things that we talk about all the time and get good adherence on the part of their population, they will actually reverse these processes. And they, they should have faith in that. But it does take compliance, and it does take recognizing that these are proven policies that will work. And, and again, you know, in Vermont, as the governor has just said, it's not an emergency for us to have the mandate for masking, but for many of the states, it's actually been implemented in a desperation move because things have gotten so bad and they need to pull every uh, bit of the armamentarium out that they can. Um, it's nice in our case that we can be very proactive and preemptive about it uh, and make sure that we can try to keep what's going well now as well as it is going uh, for the future. Great, thank you, Doctor. <clears throat> Governor, um, during the uh, during the debates this week, uh, you uh, expressed surprise uh, at, at a, a man named Ted Bunch from an outfit called Call to Men, 
uh, talking about uh, putting the kids putting wallets on the dashboard or anything. I mean, are you are you aware that that did any of all of us who grew up near uh, a major city like we grew up outside of Boston, and, and we got the talk when when we got our driver's license that you know you, you kept your hands on the wheel until the officer approached the car. You know, you, you tried to be polite, uh, spoke when spoken to, answered questions, stuff like that. Uh, and, and even for, for those of us who had parents who grew up during the Depression, I mean, we were told to, like, you know, keep money in our wallet so we wouldn't get busted for vagrancy. I mean, it, uh, were, are you aware that this is not just a, a, a racial thing? Well, I, I would just say, Steve, I have a, a lot of relatives um, about my same age, cousins that live uh, in the Boston area, grew up there, uh, never experienced what, uh, what I described. Um, so obviously everyone has to be careful, but it just hit me uh, that, uh, that uh, during this conversation uh, that he was, when he was teaching his, his, one of his kids to drive, that he would have to take, it wasn't just about, you know, um, Going slow, watching the road, don't don't use your phone, et cetera, et cetera. It was the the number one issue was putting your wallet on the dashboard so that you wouldn't be reaching for something if you got stopped uh, because he was black, uh, and then uh, possibly uh, getting shot as a result. I mean, so that's something he had to teach his kids. It's not something my parents taught me. It wasn't something that I taught my kids. And my, my cousins and, and so forth that live in the Boston area, it's not something that they um, had anticipated either. So uh, again, you may have experienced something different, but it was eye-opening for me. And it just highlighted the fact that we do treat people differently. Uh, they haven't been treated equitably, and we need to do better in that regard so they don't live in fear. We should all be able yeah, to... But but when an, but when an officer approaches a car, often they can't see, you know, the the color of the driver and what they're looking for. And I'm sure Mike Sherlin will attest to this. Uh, what the officers are looking for are called furtive movements, and that you you know, no matter any whatever color you are, you you keep your hands where they can be seen by the approaching officer. It, I mean, they can't tell from 30, 40 feet away what race you are often. Uh, well, I, that, I just that found could, it, uh, uh, Steve, that could be debated, um, that, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, but I'm just sure. saying uh, we we need to do better. If, if this is someone uh, who is living in fear and living f uh, in fear of their kids uh, being being shot and, and having to take these dr drastic steps and and how uh, teaching them how to drive, then then we have a problem. So I, I just uh, again, it was eye opening for me. Uh, and something that I thought was powerful, and something that would I think we can, we can fix. Yeah. Oh well. Um, I guess it uh, it affected you differently than than it would some other people. But thank you all very much. Greg, the County Courier. Greg, the County Courier. Okay, we're gonna move on from Greg. Uh, Joe Presser, the Barton Chronicle. Hello, I'm not exactly sure to whom this question is directed. Um, it's about the uh, attribution of cases to towns. And I think it may be the reverse of the kinds of questions you've been getting before. Uh, in our case in Orleans County, we've um, been fortunate enough to have uh, remained at 14 cases during the entire pandemic. Um, but we've also noticed that some cases do not appear to have been shown up showing up uh, in the listings. Uh, for instance, we reported on a person in um, one small town who was uh, asymptomatic but was tested positive for COVID, but um, 
no uh, cases have been attributed to that town um, in the listings uh, that the state has put out, and the number of overall cases hasn't budged. And I am curious as to how the attribution is made and um, how confident you are in um, figures such as um, the 14 cases in Orleans County. Dr. Levine. Hi, Joe. I, I appreciate it if you'd send the information about the town specifically to my communications office so we can look at that specific instance. But as you know, when there's uh, zero to one case in a particular locale, we have to be very careful about publication of public health information, uh, as that can in a very small town actually become attributable. Uh, and identifying information. But rest assured, any case that is a positive case in the state is still in the total state number. But we'll, we'll, we'll be able to give you the correct reason that I'm trying to read into here on the specific case you're talking about if you'll just send that to our uh, communications office. I'm happy to do that. What it appears to us also is that it never showed up in the countywide numbers. Um, so, uh, you know, when I send this in, I would really appreciate being able to speak to someone who can explain uh, in some detail how the attributions are made. I may be completely misunderstanding what is going on, but uh, I'd love to get straightened out if that's the case. Thank you. Thank you. No, it's a very specific instance, so we'll address it that way. I understand Greg is back on the line. Greg? Yep, can you hear me? Yep. Hello, can you hear me? We can. I got her. Um, so I was going to ask about the USCIS furloughs uh, and ask for an update. Uh, however, when Steve was on the phone, um, I got an email saying that they have now been canceled and in Vermont, uh, USCIS workers are not going to be furloughed. So that's, that's great news, um, Greg. Uh, it's breaking news as well. I hadn't heard that. Um, so, in the event that my question is is a mute point at this point, Governor, I'm wondering if you just share with us what your most difficult part of of dealing with this uh, pandemic has been in the last few months. Um, I would say just anticipating what's going to happen next and making sure that we keep Vermonters safe and try and keep opening up the economy at the same time. So it's a, it's a delicate balancing act, um, difficult to, you know, keeping up. I'm very proud of the team that I've put into place here. Uh, and it gives me great comfort when I get to talk with each and every one of them almost on a daily basis about their perspectives. But, uh, but it does, uh, does keep me up at night, uh, wondering what's going to happen next, wa watching other states uh, that have had a resurgence and, uh, and wanting to make sure that we don't, uh, um, we don't have the same uh, here in Vermont. Uh, and again, trying to open up the economy a little bit at a time uh, as we do this. So it's a, it's a delicate balance. Thanks, Governor, and uh, have a great weekend. We'll chat again next week. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Eric from the Times uh, Argus. Yeah, this might be a question for Commissioner Shirley. If this mandate did have, say, like a $50 fine for people who weren't wearing, wearing masks, from a law enforcement perspective, why would that be difficult to enforce? Um, I'll let uh, well, Com Commissioner Shirley uh, answer that. I may add to it. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, it's primarily uh, difficult to enforce because there's thousands of locations and hundreds of thousands of Vermonters and visitors and uh, only a finite number of, uh, of police officers. Um, but as the governor has emphasized time and time again over the last uh, several months, uh, education is, uh, is the first uh, line here to ensure uh, compliance and uh, Vermonters have been uh, I think overwhelmingly compliant with most of the health and safety guidance. So um, falling back to a, an enforcement posture um, 
we don't see as and we don't anticipate as something that would be necessary. Greg from the Bennington Banner. Uh, hello, can you hear me? We can. Uh, greetings from Southern Vermont. Uh, first question, um, I just one very quick follow-up on the mask mandate. Uh, Governor, uh, you're talking about uh, there being an exemption for exercise, uh, indoor exercise, correct? Indoor, outdoor as well. Indoor and outdoor, outdoor as well. Okay, thank you. Um, my main question uh, is probably for Dr. Levine. I uh, just wanted to follow up with you about your conversation with the uh, Centers for Disease Control about the uh, testing discrepancies here in uh, Southern Vermont, uh, the antigen test at Manchester Medical Center, and I wanted to know if um, you could sort of characterize those conversations, let me know if uh, there is a, a leading theory or if, uh, or if there's an area where uh, that investigation is focusing. Uh, also interested if you discovered any commonalities between our experience and the experience in Maine. Sure. I wish I could give you more information than I'm going to, but here it is. Uh, very productive conversation with the Centers for Disease Control, who have likewise expressed concerns about what is going on. Uh, it's not their prime role to do some of that investigation. Uh, from an actual standpoint of the machinery, you know, the test platform, et cetera. But the FDA was also in on the call. They've assigned a uh, research scientist PhD to our case, so to speak. And um, it, they now have opened an investigation. So the reason I don't have information for you is when they open an investigation, it's like any other investigation that's opened. You don't hear about it till they have something to tell you. Um, and they, uh, they keep things very confidential after that point in time. I also am aware that the uh, manufacturer has been involved in trying to understand this better as well, uh, but we have no uh, data from them yet or uh, understanding that they've shed on uh, any light they've shed on this problem. Um, all I know about our case compared to Maine is that they're very similar circumstances. Uh, a population of people that we would not have anticipated would have uniformly had positive tests, who had positive tests, and who subsequently on PCR uh, did not have the same level of positive tests. In our case, 52 out of 56. Uh, were negative. In the main case, 24 out of 24 were negative. So that similarity exists, but it's too early in both states' investigations for us to really be able to tell you, you know, is there a smoking gun, what was it, etc. But uh, we're eagerly awaiting more news. Um, you happen to know if the main cases involved uh, gastrointestinal uh, symptoms? The main cases were uniformly asymptomatic. Asymptomatic. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's my question. Thanks, Craig. Um, and finally, Lisa Loomis from the Valor Reporter. Lisa, did you have a question? I got your email. I do. I decided to ask the question anyway, even though I sent the email to Dr. Two for Dr. Levine. The governor's mask mandate makes this question less urgent than it was prior to today. The way field select board on June 10th declined to issue a mask mandate, and the town health officer two days later issued an emergency health order for the town calling for a mask mandate. The select board decided he did not have the authority or ruled that he did not have the authority to do so, and the town health officer pointed out that he was appointed by Dr. Levine and his authority flows from Dr. Levine versus the select board. And I'm wondering, for future pandemics, what is the case? I, it sounds like a, a legal question, but again, I'll, I'll take a, I'll take a stab at it. Um, I would, if Dr. Levine had issued a, an order from his office as, as the, the chief health officer to mandate mass, then I think that would have given the health officer authority to do so. But 
Dr. Levine, in his capacity, did not issue that order. So I don't believe that he would have the authority. But that might be a better question for an attorney or maybe even um, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. We could follow up on it as well. We, we have legal capacity that can help us if, is there anything else you want to that, add that to that, Dr. Oh, Levine? That's, that's perfect. Lisa, we could. We I didn't hear what Dr. Levine was saying. He he doesn't have anything to add at this point, Lisa. He uh, she he did say that uh, we could have uh, some of our our lawyers in the, the health department take a look uh, and get you a, a proper Great. answer. Great, thank you very much. All right, that's everyone. With that, uh, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you back here on Tuesday.